Today, we are hosting a very important uh, speaker, uh, Professor Mark Mendelssohn. Uh, he will be covering a topic uh, which is titled Controversies Around uh, Infection Prevention and Treatment Options for COVID-19. So most of you might already know who Prof Mendelssohn is, but I will give you a brief uh, CV of who he is. He is a well-known professor of infectious diseases and the head of the Division of Infectious Diseases and HIV Medicine at Kortesky uh, Hospital in the in New City. He trained in infectious diseases in Cambridge and undertook postdoctoral work at the Rockefeller University in, the, in New York before moving to UCT in 2001. He is the chair of the clinicians group of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19 and Ministerial Advisory Committee for Antimicrobial Resistance. He is the co-founder of the South African Antibiotics, uh, Antibiotic Stewardship Program. And prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, his focus was on national and international policy development on antimicrobial resistance. Uh, working as a technical advisor to many international organizations, including the World Health Organization. He is the immediate past president of the International Society for Infectious Diseases and the Federation of Infectious Diseases um, Societies of Southern Africa. I think we're all excited to hear what Prof is going to say tonight. Just to remind everyone, uh, you may post your questions. Use the Q&A button and not the chat uh, button uh, for posting your questions. We'll try and collate the questions. And because sometimes we get uh, quite a number of questions, we'll try and group them according to the themes so that we can try and get Prof to answer as many questions as possible. Um, please note that the, the talk is going to take about 35 to 40 minutes, after which we'll have um, some time to ask uh, questions and Prof will engage uh, with those questions. At the end of the webinar, we will also have a poll which we will really appreciate it if you can provide us with some feedback because it helps us as we plan uh, you know, future webinars. The other important notice is that uh, you will, uh, this is a CPD accredited uh, talk uh, and therefore CPT, CPD points will be allocated. And also um, this uh, talk will also be available um, you know, post the webinar uh, for people to access it. It may not necessarily be immediate, there'll be a short lag, but uh, please be assured that you will get access to this webinar. I'm now going to ask, um, and I'm gonna now hand over to Prof uh, Mendelssohn, who is going to give us uh, this very uh, interesting uh, talk. Over to you, Prof. Thanks very much indeed for that uh, very kind introduction and good evening, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to um, join you tonight to discuss these issues. Um, I'm just going to try and put my there. So you should have my, my first slide on the screen. Um, there is a warning to this, um, to this presentation. It does contain um, two pictures of Donald Trump. So um, if any of you are particularly um, uh, weak uh, stomached in, this, in that uh, respect, then um, uh, please forgive me. So, um, so I've been asked to, to look at the controversies around infection prevention and treatment options for COVID-19. Um, and the, uh, I don't have any uh, disclosures to make that would affect this, this talk. Um, I'm going to deal really with the talk in two parts. Um, I'm going to first off um, talk about some of the issues around infection prevention, um, including um, controversies around masking, uh, around the use of PPE, and uh, try and talk a little bit about healthcare worker exposure, reducing the risks, and then move on to the treatment side. Um, and some of the frequently uh, asked questions around um, current treatments uh, that patients who uh, acquire SARS-CoV-2 um, may be on, uh, whether there's a place for investigational antivirals, and then talk a little bit about uh, the issues around non-invasive ventilation. So starting with the infection prevention part, our model 
current model and a model that's been in place for a, a very long time is based on work by Flucher and by Wells. Um, and it's a classic model that we all know well, in so much as uh, large droplets, which may carry upper respiratory tract um, uh, pathogens like viruses, um, in terms of droplet spread, tend to be large. They tend to be uh, to drop uh, by gravity within one, uh, around one, 1 1.5 meters from, from the person expelling the droplet. Um, but then the model also um, discusses the potential for airborne or small droplet uh, uh, nuclei that are um, taken a much uh, greater distance from uh, the source. And so when we think about droplet spread uh, viruses, respiratory viruses, influenza particularly, um, and as you know, SARS-CoV-2, the, the cause of COVID-19 has been um, predominantly thought to be droplet spread. Whereas when we think classically about small droplet nuclei, we're thinking about TB and airborne precautions. Now that's starting to be challenged um, by uh, a number of studies, one of which um, is shown here, um, where there's a now the hypothesis of, a, of the multi-phase turbulent gas clouds, which basically means that when you expel um, droplets, that's expelled within um, a gas cloud which has variable sizes of the droplets and has moisture in it. And the moisture um, allows in part uh, um, the droplets, particularly the smaller droplets, um, to desiccate less. Uh, and to tra transfer to a, a potentially a greater distance. So our thinking around how far and how quickly um, droplets from our airways that may be infected with um, SARS-CoV-2 um, is, is starting to be challenged by some of these studies. We are predominantly still working on the fact that the, in the majority, um, the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 is on larger droplets and will scatter in a relatively close distance towards us. But there is this realization of slight further moving droplets. And that, that has been borne out by a couple of observational studies, very small numbers um, from both China and uh, from the US, which looked at rooms that patients were in. They, and they swabbed almost everything in those rooms, including ventilation grates. Um, and the important, first important thing to say is in the Chinese study, um, when the room had been, when they, when they tested by swapping for SARS-CoV-2 in, um, in uh, the rooms that had been uh, decontaminated, uh, been cleaned, there was no, no virus found. But in both of these studies, um, there were samples uh, that were found to have SARS-CoV-2 from the ventilation grates and the air grates, suggesting that there may have been um, droplet spread um, and, and desiccation of the droplets carrying very small um, particles to up into the grates. So some credence for a, a slightly expanded uh, concept of how this spreads um, is starting to, to, to be seen. The important thing about infection control is in our rush to masks and personal protective equipment, I think that we're all forgetting that infection control, the basis of infection control lies in administrative controls, the critical nature, critical importance of triaging patients and their placement within our health services, the importance of physical distancing and hand hygiene practices putting in place with early implementation of, of the precautions uh, including how we administer healthcare workers and maybe we should be screening healthcare workers on a daily basis. So these administrative controls actually give you quite a big bang for your buck in terms of the number of people that they may impact on and protect. Then we have the environmental controls, including the regular cleaning, which we really um, highlighted already, 
uh, and the optimizing air changes, you know, opening windows, ensuring that um, there is air changes of these drops so to take these potentially infected droplets. And then the PPE in terms of the masks, gloves, gowns and aprons really protect, predominantly protect um, the healthcare worker. But that brings into, uh, and, and uh, that brings into uh, particular importance when we're thinking about administrative and environmental controls, uh, in addition to PPE, because of the increasing realization that there are uh, a, a substantial number of asymptomatically infected persons who may transmit either as asymptomatics or probably more commonly as in a pre-symptomatic phase before they, uh, before they show symptoms. And this study in a nurse, in a long-term care facility uh, from the US uh, of 89 residents, 76 were tested by RT-PCR and 23, 23 of those were found to be positive, half of whom were asymptomatic. But of those 12 people that were asymptomatic, 11 were actually pre-symptomatic because they actually had clinical symptoms within a couple of days of that test. Also, those that were tested negative, the 52 of the 76 were tested negative, were retested um, uh, uh, it, uh, four, four or five days later. And of those that were negative, 24 were positive. And again, um, of the asymptomatics, 13 were actually pre-symptomatic. So the critical importance of good infection prevention control, um, including the administration, including the environment, including the critical nature or issues or as best we can of trying to physically distance the critical nature of hand hygiene, decontamination of surfaces, et cetera, are all really important because we're probably missing, even at this stage, an awful lot of people who potentially could be um, transmitting as pre-symptomatics or asymptomatics. Now, in terms of cloth masks, this is, as you know, is being um, strongly recommended in South Africa, and there's more uh, impetus occurring now in other countries in the world to, uh, for populations to adopt cloth masks. And as we come out of level five into level four and potentially lower levels, the, the, the reality of cloth masks is that they're an extension of cough etiquette. They are in fact to, to try and as an altruistic reduction, if everybody wears a cloth mask, there's going to be trapping of um, droplets with uh, SARS-CoV-2 on from either pre-symptomatic or potentially asymptomatic. Hopefully the symptomatic people will be at home. But if everybody wears cloth masks, then we will reduce them, the amount of virus in the vicinity on surfaces and hopefully reduce transmission. So cloth masks are being uh, a very, uh, very strongly recommended and particularly for things like public transport, et cetera. But what about universal masking in hospitals for the healthcare workers in the COVID era? And that's, that's under increasing debate now. And some hospitals, particularly in, in the Western Cape, mine included, have started to adopt this. Um, again, with the increasing acceptance of the asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic per persons um, who may be admitted for other reasons, um, but like cloth masks, these are really not a panacea. These are one piece of the jigsaw around infection prevention that together will show the right picture. And we really need to att attend to all issues around infection prevention. But I think that the wearing of, um, of medical masks, I do not suggest um, that healthcare workers and certainly on the front line wear cloth masks and certainly um, We'll come on to the N95 masks in a minute, but um, it is possible that uh, one should be thinking uh, more around medical masks if resources allow in our hospitals and health, uh, health centers and clinics. So PPE is a really hot topic internationally. There's a variety. Um, we look at high income countries with their hazmat suits. Uh, and in reality, what most of us are using are aprons, gloves, and either a medical mask or an N95 mask, uh, shown in the top um, 
uh, center. And uh, some people uh, may be using these more industrial type filtered masks, but in general, those are, are not being used in the health service. And the critical issue, of course, is access um, to PPE and the importance around this. And in, in general, personal protective equipment should always be um, worn in the terms of risk stratification. So we don't all work, walk around in hazmat suits with N95 masks, um, goggles, etc. You know, we it's a risk stratification, and the national uh, guidelines and uh, we have to acknowledge Shaheen Mehta and her group who have put together some really excellent guidelines. These are all on the NICD website. Um, and there are specific times when one would wear personal protective equipment, um, different types. And the N95 respirator in particular is for aerosol generating procedures. And the donning and doffing, in other words, the putting on and taking off of the personal protective equipment is critical particularly the taking off, the so-called doffing. If you're going to infect yourself, um, it's probably gonna be at that point. And so there are um, guides and the, um, the link at the bottom is a, a link to a video of how to don and off. So this is critical around PPE, when we use it, different circumstances and how we put it on and take it off. But what constitutes an aerosol generating procedure? We're pretty comfortable that intubation is probably the highest risk. Um, ENT surgery, endoscopy, bronchoscopy, uh, thoracic surgery, all entering um, the prime place for the SARS-CoV-2 virus to be lurking. Even the nasopharyngeal aspirates that we do for testing are deemed to be aerosol generating procedure. But there's now questions about what else might be. And one of the questions at the moment is whether second stage labor um, with a, you know, a vigorous panting and other uh, and potentially um, you know, uh, ex forced exhalations might potentially be a general generating procedure. And we're looking at the evidence of that and we'll uh, be advising on it further shortly. A lot of people ask about extended use of the PPE or reprocessing, can you reprocess it? The general advice is that we would prefer to extend the use of PPE um, when, there are, when there are stock issues rather than repro reprocess. Um, if people are wearing N95 respirators, working in testing centers or in you know, not on COVID wards, um, then those respirators can be um, taken off safely with um, a, a, a tissue put into a brown uh, paper bag and reused. Um, and generally N95 respirators have a continuous lifespan. If you were continuously wearing it for around eight hours or so, the bands start to become loose. Otherwise, and the integrity of the mask can suffer. Um, and other parts of the PPE can uh, be extended use. The reprocessing um, is a work in progress and WHO are doing quite a lot of work on this. But at the moment, um, we would prefer to try and extend the use and also you know, really concentrate on who's using particular pieces of equipment like the N95 respirators and trying to um, optimize that use. A, a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Basil Vretos and uh, orthopedic colleagues have been doing some work on how you could put together your um, uh, private practice rooms um, to see patients as we come out of lockdown. Um, there are a variety of common sense um, interventions for infection prevention, um, you know, ensuring physical distancing. If there are waiting rooms, um, you can leave people in the car and call them in so that you're not mixing too many people. Um, covering furniture with plastic covers, etc. And so there's a lot of work that can be done to make the workplace safer. If per patients, if healthcare workers do become um, infected, there are now guidelines which are shown here on um, how the return to work should occur and what the occupational health issues are. So if you if you do get COVID-19. Um, and self-isolate self at home. The return to work is really timed, if in mild cases, to 14 days, 
um, after the symptom onset and in people who have severe COVID can potentially return to work 14 days after clinical stability, which is um, around uh, when oxygen requirement, oxygen is no longer required. If you are a healthcare worker and you have a high, a, 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 um, become symptomatic, obviously you need testing. If the test is positive, you become scenario one. If it's negative, then you stay at home until you're better. And then there's the issue around the healthcare worker who is exposed. If it's a high risk exposure, a known COVID case, PPE is not being used, et cetera, then you self quarantine at home. And if you're asymptomatic through seven days, then on day eight, you have a, a, a test, an RT-PCR. And if that's negative, you can return to work using PPE to day 14. And if it's a very low risk um, exposure, then it's just monitoring and you don't need to um, self quarantine. So we have guidelines now um, for uh, uh, confirmed or exposed healthcare workers. We're also drawing up guidelines, and I, I'd, I'd like to say that this is a draft um, that is not finalised, but there is a, a, an appreciation that healthcare workers over the age of 60 are a um, high-risk group for severe COVID disease, as are pay persons with high-risk comorbidities. And so we're trying to do some work on how healthcare workers over the age of 60 um, should be, or with those with high, high risk comorbidities, should be deployed in the workspace. In general, if you're uh, 60 to 69 with no high risk comorbidity, then working in non-COVID areas with meticulous attention to infection control, um, those who are over uh, between 60 and 69 with a high risk comorbidity or a person younger with a high risk comorbidity, that we uh, suggestion the guideline is not to participate in frontline care of proven uh, COVID cases or PUIs, and perhaps attend more to non-COVID related activities such as telemedicine, academic support, and provision of university support, et cetera. And then pay persons over the age of 70, they, they suggest the guidelines to not undertake clinical work. It's a, totally appreciated how many colleagues, valued colleagues, are um, within these age brackets, particularly in our private practice. And this is, in the end, a guideline. It's not an enforce, it's not a mandate. Um, it's not mandatory, but this is the guidance and the greater, the larger document will explain more. This is really time in terms of prevention to optimize patient management for all those comorbidities listed here, which are related to severe COVID. So critical that the persons with HIV, if not on antiretrovirals, get on to antiretrovirals. Critical that we try and improve diabetic control and all of these, however difficult this may be, um, it is important. And also your patients, I would say, who um, are high risk groups for influenza, really important um, that a second hit is tr we try to um, mitigate that. And so influenza vaccination, has never been more important, I think, now um, as it is right at this moment, apart from obviously in um, pandemic, influenza pandemics um, and, and large, large outbreaks. Lastly, in terms of prophylaxis, there are a lot of trials um, of prophylaxis going on, particularly uh, for healthcare workers, particularly prophylaxis uh, using a hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. And this is just one example a colleague um, in Minnesota who have um, already enrolled about a thousand healthcare workers um, either getting a placebo or hydroxychloroquine for five days um, and trying to see if it um, reduces hospitalization. Um, and so I think watch this space uh, and we'll see more because there are literally a lot of trials going on. So moving from prevention, I want to now move on to some of the controversies around, um, around treatment. And I'd like to pay tribute to Jeremy Nell and the writing committee of the clinical management guidelines, um, which I recommend highly to you, are available on the um, NICD website as referenced here. And a lot of what I'm gonna say um, is thoughts that have come uh, through this um, by the team are in the guidelines. So it's often, the, often a lot of issues um, around symptomatic treatment. Is it safe to use non-steroidal uh, drugs, anti-inflammatory drugs in COVID? There were some concerns 
initially that NSAIDs may worsen COVID. There's no good evidence. Although what we're saying is as a first treatment of first choice, we suggest paracetamol for the relief of fever and pain. But if, if patients are on non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, um, then they shouldn't be discontinued purely for the COVID reason. Um, so we believe that non-steroidals are fine to continue in that um, setting. There's also concern in asthma and COPD that nebulized drugs um, may, in nebulization may increase the risk um, of respiratory uh, viral transmission. The aerosolization obviously is made by the machine and prior to um, getting into the body rather than us um, aerosolizing to a great extent. But again, as a precautionary principle, um, it's suggested in the guidelines that um, if possible, we use spaces um, more. And we've had a number of pa patients admitted to our, our personal and investigation wards um, who have uh, done very well on spaces with MDI rather than requiring the nebulizer. If they do require a nebulizer, if they fail on that, then we would put them in the isolation room and uh, with good PPE for all and nebulize. And if with the spaces, you can disinfect spaces between patients um, as shown here with soap and water um, and an alcohol wipe or a chlorine-based disinfectant. The other big question, Mark, um, is commonly asked around the use of um, uh, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin uh, receptor blockers in COVID. We know uh, this panel on the left shows that it's the ACE2 receptor um, in, uh, across different primates, including humans, that are the, um, is the receptor for SARS-CoV-2, the, the novel coronavirus causing COVID-2. And there's concern around the potential in diabetes and hypertensives on ACE inhibitors and, AR, and ARBs that that might increase ACE2 expression and therefore increase severity of SARS by increasing binding. And that's the hypothesis, but there is actually no good evidence for that. And even very recently, one study um, uh, showing, suggesting a, a small study, suggesting that actually if you were on patients that were on um, ACE inhibitors or an, an, an ARB with COVID-19 actually um, did better than those that were not. Um, I think we need, you know, we need to say at this stage there's no good evidence to stop patients' um, ACE inhibitors or uh, angiotensin receptor blockers um, and uh, one would continue it in patients. So that's the, uh, that would be the advisory. So what about antivirals uh, and SARS-CoV-2? Um, no, putting light inside the body or drinking detergents are not gonna be the answer, but do we have an answer at all? And the national, the NEMLAC, the National EML Committee um, has developed a therapeutic guidelines subcommittee for COVID-19. Um, uh, Andy Gray has been very instrumental, so I'd like to pay tribute to all of them. And at this website, um, you would be, we will be able to find um, guidelines and advisories on potential antivirals for the use of COVID and whether or not to be used. So the first one, I just want to look at each of them very quickly. Um, the, the first one, again, has been uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, highly touted by President Trump um, and really dismissing any potential um, adverse reactions. And we know that uh, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, both can prolong QT interval and a number of the other uh, antivirals, uh, including Alluvia, lapinavir, ritonavir, which is another suggested antiviral and sometimes used in combination, can also increase QT as can azithromycin, which is um, again, sometimes used because of some very small, uh, slightly flawed studies using hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin from France. And so there is, you know, this is a, a question mark. Um, it is, but it, there is potential for harm. And the EML group um, did the review, uh, found two 
small randomized controlled trials, both from China, very small numbers, um, with a lot of problems with these because they were using multiple other drugs as standard of care, um, but using hydroxychloroquine um, at a couple, each one had a slightly different regimen. And really, there wasn't good evidence um, either way. And the, the uh, ruling by the NEMLAC at the moment is that there's currently insufficient evidence to recommend routine use of chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine um, in patients. But it is, and, and all patients um, who are, who, if you want to administer this, um, should either be as part of a, a therapeutic trial or I'll come on to um, being prescribed under the MURI framework. The other drug, another drug um, well known to all of us, of course, is lopinavir, ritonavir, or Aluvia. And the interest in this really came from the SARS epidemic in 2002, where one small study, um, retrospective study, looked at um, whether the SARS, whether lopinavir, ritonavir, um, had had an effect, and it seemed potentially, um, in addition to ribavirin, to reduce um, ARDS and death. But it was a, a small study and, and wasn't substantiated because SARS um, uh, uh, epidemic came under control. There has been um, a study recently in the New England Journal on lopinavir ritonavir, which really showed no benefit of lopinavir ritonavir on clinical improvement, time to clinical improvement, or uh, viral um, swab uh, negativity. Um, it was a randomized controlled open label study. Um, and it, uh, it did note that uh, lopinavir ritonavir was stopped early uh, because of gastrointestinal side effects, as we all know, and diarrhea in particular, um, in, in a 14, almost 14%, which is significant. And again, um, the, 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 the EML committee made um, a decision that there was no, no good evidence uh, that currently that um, lopinavir ritonavir should uh, be used for the treatment of SARS-CoV-2. Interferon was another, it's another drug that's been touted. Um, unfortunately, incorrect um, information from the um, city of Ekulani's executive mayor some time ago, suggesting that we should be procuring a interferon vaccine from Cuba, got things a bit mixed up. Um, but there is no evidence, um, and again, the, the, the guidelines, that it, there's no evidence for, to suggest the use of interferon um, as an antiviral against SARS-CoV-2 in practice outside of an experiment uh, therapeutic trial. Remdesivir is a small molecule um, uh, nucleotide analog prodrug, uh, which then inhibits the RNA polymerase and was uh, of interest in particular in Ebola, um, largely because of its effects on in primate models, um, suggesting benefit in reducing um, replication and protecting the animals. In COVID-19, um, there have been very small studies. Um, the compassionate use remdesivir study by Gilead really was just an observational study um, of persons who were really very sick uh, with no control group um, in, in China. And they showed for what it was worth um, an improvement in about two thirds of uh, patients. A leaked data from um, a key remdesivir study was removed from the WHO website last week, um, but has actually been published um, 20 minutes ago <laughs> before we started the talk in The Lancet. And what it showed um, this is a, a, a randomized a controlled trial in Wuhan um, of hospitalized patients, 155 in the remdesivir group and 78 in the placebo group. Um, it was stopped early because the, the epidemic had come under control, so they didn't meet their, map, their targets. But as you can see, there's no difference in cumulative improvement rate or in viral, um, uh, viral shedding. And so um, this has failed to show uh, any benefit, but does, of course, have that limitation of not meeting its target enrollment, and therefore it needs uh, bigger trials. 
Uh, so remdesivir, again, is not, there's no recommendation for remdesivir to be used uh, in clinical practice in South Africa outside of therapeutic trials. A, a lot of attention now is being turned towards the immunopathology of um, SARS-CoV-2 infection um, with an increasing understanding of the importance of various facets of the immune system and particularly um, cytokine storm. And the model that's being um, sort of generated is one of initial infection where there's high levels of virus, um, at which time you start to become symptomatic uh, with respiratory symptoms, uh, you became lymphopenic, um, and then as you go into the pulmonary phase, as some patients will go, people will go into the pulmonary phase. Remember, most people, of course, will either be asymptomatic or remain have very mild disease. These, but those that do go into the pulmonary phase start off to, into a progression of increasing inflammation and then potentially those who become very serious and into um, uh, respiratory failure and ARDS may be being driven by a hyperinflammatory phase um, which may be uh, very largely driven via cytokine storm almost hemophagocytic lymphocytic histiocytosis like syndrome and so the antivirals may have an effect um, across the board, but particularly, you know, obviously in stage one and two, but then immunomodulators may come into play. And there's increasing interest around immunomodulators and particularly um, the IL-6 um, uh, receptor inhibitor, um, tocilizumab. And IL-6 became of interest, particularly from some of the Chinese studies um, from Wuhan, this study looking at 150 patients from Wuhan identified IL-6 as, um, as increased in those that died. Uh, and interesting in this study, also one thing to just point out is that myocarditis seemed to be um, important in a small percentage, but um, we are starting to recognize myocarditis as well as a respiratory component. But IL-6 seemed to be important. And tocilizumab is an, a, an antagonist, both of the soluble and the membrane bound receptor, and it blocks signal transduction and uh, theoretically will reduce cytokine, uh, part of the cytokine storm and perhaps benefit in that respect. But at present, there just aren't the studies. So again, at the moment, we're in a position where we need more research on this and therapeutic trials. Although the recommendation is that these drugs are not for use outside of therapeutic trials, there is the possibility of using them under the MURI framework, which is a, an ethical framework which was developed by WHO in 2014 around the um, Ebola um, epidemic. And um, it really replaces the term compassionate use or extended use. Um, and there's a number of hoops one has to jump through to be able to use these drugs, um, but uh, including ethics committee and consents and other issues. So, but it is possible potentially to use these drugs and some people are using some of them through the MURI framework. It's critical that we have big, good trials and South Africa um, are part of the WHO trial led by um, Helen Rees and Jeremy Nell in, this, in South Africa. And it's really, it's standard of care versus standard of care plus either chloroquine, uh, remdesivir, lopinavir um, or lopinavir plus interferon. And as more antivirals come online, they will be plugged in. But this is a multi-country, enormous trial with very big numbers, which is going to be required to actually answer some of these because a lot of the trials we're seeing and basing our knowledge on are actually relatively uh, poor numbers. There are a lot of other investigational therapeutics that are not going to come, and I think we can get rid of detergents and ultraviolet light, but there are various other immunomodulators, IL-1 inhibitors, um, Janus uh, kinase uh, inhibitors, and a number of other antivirals, none of which are proven. In terms of steroids, the advisory is that we, at present, are advising not to give systemic steroids. I know there is an increasing body of thought around the use of corticosteroids for the inflammatory, hyperinflammatory stage. Um, so I'm saying this with that caveat. However, in general, respiratory viruses that have been treated with steroids um, have shown poor benefit and even prolonged viral shedding, particularly with SARS 
uh, MERS and SARS-CoV-2, so they're not recommended. Probably, or definitely, I think, the most critical um, therapeutic maneuver in managing SARS-CoV-2 in hospitalized patients is clearly um, oxygen therapy. And um, depending on the severity, patients will require um, either nasal cannulae, face masks, reservoir bags, um, or even obviously further potential non-invasive ventilation or mechanical ventilation. And the targets for supplemental oxygen in a non-pregnant adult is um, PO2s are greater than uh, uh, 90%. And you can reuse nasal cannulae. Um, are you, sorry, you cannot reuse nasal cannulae, but you can um, you reuse a dis heat disinfect face masks and reservoir bags. One of the real problems and the real rise in our attention with we need, we need to give on the potential for non-invasive techniques is the, um, is the increasing evidence of the really poor outcomes that patients have who are actually ventilated. And this study is probably the worst I've seen um, where in 12 hospitals in New York City, um, the overall mortality on a ventilator was 88%. And if you were over 65, it was 97%. And that varies. There are other um, studies with, with lesser amounts from the UK, Italy, um, and elsewhere. But it's bad news if you have to go into a mechanical ventilator for mechanical ventilation. So what can you do to alter that? Well, when we're using oxygen that I've already dis discussed, people will know that you can use proning in ARDS in the ICU, but there's now a move for conscious proning. Um, so in the ward, and this is from the Intensive Care Society in the UK, um, giving the reasons why it improves um, uh, air gas exchange and a, um, a, uh, a schedule for position changes, um, lying fully prone on the side, sitting up, uh, and, and the sort of cycle can repeat. Um, and and uh, this slide will be, these slides will be available to you, so I, I recommend it to you. We've, we've been using conscious proning in the wards to really pretty good effect um, and discussion with others around the country. This seems to be something that we should really be uh, trying to attend to. Um, the, there is an issue with the non-invasive ventilations with CPAP and high-flow oxygen. There's been a concern around the aerosol generation in these procedures. Um, and I think that's put people off. In SARS in 2002 um, epidemic, actually one of the studies, there weren't a number of, many of these studies, but one of the studies suggested um, that actually you have more aerosolization with mechanical in, in ventilation uh, in terms of uh, risk to the staff. So the odds ratio of the nurses becoming infected was much higher um, in uh, intubated patients versus those that were undergoing a non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or high frequency oscillatory um, and, and procedures. And I think we have to be more canny. We have to, get, we have to find ways like these of delivering CPAP um, and other non-invasive uh, means of oxygenation to try and um, improve oxygen um, delivery to our patients who need it and try and avoid, if we can, mechanical bank ventilation. The, the Critical Care Society, and thanks to Dean Gopalan for this um, slide, have been doing a lot of work and their website's excellent um, and I would go to it. There's an advisory now around the use of um, uh, non-invasive um, ox uh, oxygen delivery. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the issue is that there isn't enough evidence at the moment to not, you know, to really push this uh, in, in favour of mechanical ventilation when somebody really needs to be mechanically ventilated and we are going to have to ventilate people. But there is an increasing realisation and support for non-invasive methods. And again, the society, I'm not going to go into this, um, I think it's a talk on its own from people far more experienced than I in critical care, but the Critical Care Society have um, developed guidance around referral to ICU for COVID uh, and everybody would be um, assessed uh, on the basis pre predominantly of a priority score, um, which takes in both principles of um, 
uh, scoring to save lives and scoring for the most life years um, saved and a point system based on SOFA scores uh, and prognosis in terms of long-term uh, survival. And patients are then placed, depending on their score, into highest priority for ventilation and lowest priority. And the truth is, of course, as South Af in South Africa, as we always have done, we have to be careful and we have to be able to, uh, we have to, be able to actually um, triage and to make difficult decisions. I'm not going to, to um, dwell on this, but just to say that we're understanding more and more that actually it's not one size fits all when it comes to the very severe end of the pneumonia. And there do seem to be two types of AR, uh, of pneumonia, severe pneumonia in, in, CO, in COVID-19. One which is the more traditional, the H type, ARDS, but a, a type which is atypical um, with respiratory mechanics that are different to what one normally sees. And that requires different settings for ventilation and different approach. And I think we'll learn more and more about this as we go forward. There's fantastic resources out there. I would, I would certainly, if you haven't already found it, the NICD website with all the guidelines, really a great um, uh, opportunity for learning and for guidance. And I'd like to finish by acknowledging Dean and Juan Ambrosini for um, uh, some of the, the slides, a couple of slides and the images. Um, the, the members of the Ministry of Advisory Committee, uh, particularly the clinicians group and Jeremy Nell um, has led on the clinical guidelines and Shaheen Mehta on many of the IPC issues and in, many of my thoughts around IPC have been shaped um, with discussion with her and the group. And then Andy Gray and the NEMLAC COVID um, Committee and the National Department of Health and I'd like to leave it there and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Prof, uh, for such an informative uh, talk. Uh, we've got quite a lot of questions that we would like you to assist uh, with addressing right now. I think I'm going to start with the questions that relate to PPE. There are quite a few. Um, I think, though, the one important one is around um, advice uh, to general practitioners around you know, which type of masks to use if they are not collecting specimens, so they are not part of the, of the collection of specimens. So which one would you recommend? Um, then there was a question around the use of face shields uh, without using them with masks. Uh, what your recommendation or your thoughts are around that? And I think um, the other big question, uh, considering the, the, you know, the, the limited availability of PPE, is the practicality of extended use in some settings. Um, I think one of the questions was talking to, uh, you know, um, healthcare workers uh, required to probably use about 50 uh, masks per month uh, and uh, how practical that is and what you are doing also in your unit to try and maximize uh, PPE use. So maybe I'll leave it at that and then we'll uh, get to the next uh, round of questions uh, after you've answered. Thanks. Bob. Thanks very much. Um, all, all very good questions and on the minds of many people. Uh, so in terms of firstly the face shields, um, I wouldn't recommend using a face shield without a mask. Um, it might keep you dry but it's not going to reduce the amount of um, droplets that potentially you're going to breathe in. I do think it's an option in for GPs um, in addition with um, a standard medical mask. Um, I mean, again, we're learning as we go in this, as, as you know. In fact, I should have probably started my, my talk with the disclaimer that we normally do, that you know, things are moving so fast that what I tell you tonight may be different in a week's time. But you know, I think the, the, the issue is that for the general practitioners who are not... Um, not doing any aerosol, aerosol generating procedures. Um, it's probably fine to wear a medical mask. Um, thinking about how your practice is set up when you're not you know, having to be very close to the patients in terms of physical distancing and all the other infection control issues. But I would say a, a medical mask with a face shield, if you are concerned, um, you know, if, if uh, occasionally, I, I, you know, I do know some colleagues are wearing N95 respirators, Really, we're trying, obviously, with the, the stock issues to avoid that. Um, so I think a medical mask with a face shield. 
Um, the practicality of extended use, yeah, again, I, I appreciate that in many settings, it's gonna be very difficult to um, extend use um, of, of PPE. Um, I think it's up to us um, and up to the government, you know, to try and really um, try and assure access to the, the PPE we need. And that's not just in the hospitals, but uh, in the community settings for our, our, our GPs and family practitioners. Um, but in terms of extension, I think again, with the masks, my, my medical mask, surgical mask, I mean, I, I don't wear, I, I wear it when, I, when I'm in my office, and I don't wear it when I go out, I do, but I, I then hang it up. I'm very careful about hand hygiene, you know, bef before you put it on, when you're taking it off. Um, and then, you know, that will last me uh, at least a day, two days, maybe three days. N95s, if you're using them very, very infrequently, again, take them off carefully with, uh, with a tissue, place them in a, a bag, take them out with the tissue, put them back on, wash your hands, and you're ready to go again. So I think that's the way we can improve longevity um, rather than using up too many. Thank you so much, Prof. I think I'm just gonna group uh, some of the questions around uh, other therapies uh, that um, you know, have been uh, proposed. So one of them being uh, the use of uh, intravenous um, uh, vitamin C and vitamin D. Um, there, uh, there was another question around, uh, let me just see. So I think those are the two. And then there's a, there's a, there's a combination uh, treatment for patients who have been shown to have DIC and thrombi. Apparently this was from autopsies. Um, you know, then um, the question is around the use of two doses of heparin um, combined with vitamin C and hydroxyquinone. Uh, so your take on that. So I think those are, I think the last one on treatment is the use of diamox and astrazolamide in ICU for management of patients uh, with a high altitude pulmonary edema. And then the last one is evamicitin and uh, the use of nicotine. So those are more all, all treatment related questions that have come up around some of the, of the molecules that have, uh, have been tested, uh, but it's just uh, the level of evidence that um, uh, is still lacking and also what your recommendation is. So I'm, I'm not an ICU specialist and I, you know, I, I, there are many ICU critical care people who are using a number of, uh, a number of um, therapies that, you know, may have logic. I mean, I think if they're used under the MURI framework, that's fine. Um, I think of all of there's no there's no evidence for any of these. Okay, so in terms of COVID nineteen, so there may be evidence for certain um, certain therapies outside of um, of uh, COVID nineteen. I know that the high altitude, the HAPE um, type scenario is one of the um, one of the sort of um, parallels that's being drawn with some of the COVID patients. Um, if there's no evidence um, for acetazolamide in COVID, so if the if the NEMLAC um, did did a did a, an advisory on that, we'd be coming up with the same issue that there would need to be a, under an investigational use um, as a in a therapeutic trial. I do think there's I do think it's important around particularly in severe COVID, the issue around anticoagulation. Um, I think we, we are recognising more and more the the issue around. Um, the potential for, for for clotting, and generally we we in the severe the severe patients certainly we would um, be looking to anticoagulate them. Um, so I think that does have merit. The other um, the intravenous vitamin infusions, nicotine, etc. I don't know the evidence for those, um, but there's no good evidence at all in COVID in, in the treatment of COVID nineteen. There may be many treatments that have basis in sepsis and other, you know, other um, uh, other diseases which currently are commonly present in ICU. But again, in COVID, in terms of COVID nineteen, there's no good evidence. Thank you so much, Prof. I think um, the other question, which is very important in our setting, is really the relationship between HIV and COVID nineteen, um, and whether patients who have got you know, who are well controlled on ART, um, you know, are at lower risk 
and also what your experience has been um, you know, in those patients who are co-infected, HIV, TB co-infection and uh, uh, have COVID. We know that the numbers are still relatively low, but just to share some of your thoughts. Yeah, so, I mean, it's prob as, you know, we're probably the only country in the world, or one of the only countries in the world, that's really going to be able to answer this question, you know, sadly, because we are going to be seeing, obviously, a surge now in cases. And the, the truth, as you pointed out, is that we just don't know. There, there's only one case series of um, HIV patients in COVID, which was from Barcelona. It was five patients who were all, uh, four of them were on antiretrovirals, one not. And they did well, but I mean, it means nothing. So our, we're using the same sort of precautionary principle plus the the, the uh, knowledge that we have from HIV's interaction with other viral respiratory viruses, particularly influenza. I'm not saying that influenza and SARS-CoV-2 equate, of course, but we know that if you're if you're have got advanced immunosuppression, not on antiretrovirals, there's a worse outcome with um, uh, influenza and other respiratory viruses, and we expect that to be the case with COVID-19 um, as well. So we. Um, I've had a relatively small experience so far. We've had two HIV patients with COVID. It's not enough to give you any um, real flavor of what would happen. And again, as I said in the talk, the critical issue now is to optimize as quickly as we can. Um, people uh, you know, living with HIV, their adherence to treatment, explaining to them again why it's so important. Um, and and, and really doing the studies, having registries, um, and hopefully perhaps the, um, the, the solidarity study and other studies may give us some uh, better idea. HIV is a recognized severe comorbidity um, for nationally for COVID-19 um, on that precautionary principle. TB as well is, um, as you'll see in the coming days. And so, you know, we recognize the, the threat that this poses to our HIV population. Um, and we hope that as we can get, as we have more and more unantiretrovirals, that uh, hopefully that will be mitigated in part. Okay, Prof, there's a, an interesting question around the presence of the virus in blood or sexual fluids. Okay, so. Um, I have seen nothing recently to suggest that um, virus is really in blood. All the studies I've uh, seen so far, and they're small, have suggested not. Um, we have at present, again, I, I'm not aware of any studies, and if anybody does know, please, um, please put me right, of um, SARS-CoV-2 in, sex, sex, in, sexual, in se seminal fluid or... In, in any genital secretions. Um, we know it gets into the kidney, we know it gets into multiple organs, and there may be, I mean, we're not, obviously we don't know this because people aren't really looking at it. Um, and maybe again, that's something we would be able to do. But uh, as, as, as so far as we know, it's not sexually transmitted um, and it's not um, significant in significant amounts in blood. Another very topical question, Prof, is around, um, you know, antibody testing uh, and, you know, uh, immunity related to those who have, uh, you know, who have been seen to have antibodies. Looking at the Aaron study and those patients who were, you know, presymptomatic, would, a, would an antibody type of screening have uh, offered any value in that, in that study if it was used uh, to, to test some of those patients? It's, it's a matter of timing, isn't it? I mean, serology tests are not, the serology tests uh, for, for SARS-CoV-2, firstly, this is internationally, as I'm sure people have been following, is incredibly difficult. They're very difficult to find a test that, that can be validated properly. There's no really good validated tests so far. SARPRA, Helen Reese and SARPRA are looking at this very carefully for potential registration of tests only to be used in terms of a, guide, a strict guideline protocol. But these are not 
tests for acute diagnosis as they stand. So in that outbreak, um, if some of the PERS people had been um, infected previously and had mounted antibodies, if there was a test that validated that did pick it up, it may have, you know, it may have found it. But it's not really, these tests are great for seroepidemiological studies. Um, unless there's a, a really massive shift and new, new um, technology, new tests that we find, um, serology isn't really for acute diagnosis. So its main area of use will be in seroepidemiological studies um, as we go forward in the epidemic. But I don't think it would have helped in that study. And then the other question, uh, very interesting, is around uh, the role of heaters in, in, in the spread, in droplet spread, uh, if heaters could actually assist in preventing droplet spread. Do you mean heaters in the home? Yes, a heater, yes. I don't think that would, no, I don't think that would do anything, to be honest. Um, no, I, I can't see, I mean, as I said, it, if you have COVID-19, um, then areas of the room will be contaminated um, with the virus. Again, when we, when we talk about these studies in rooms and in air conditioners and all these sort of things, it's important to remember that we're picking up, um, we're picking up nucleic acids here. We're not necessarily picking up uh, live virus that can then be it continue to be shed. So when it, if it got into the air conditioning area, it doesn't mean automatically that it's going to be, you know, you're going to be shedding, pushing out live virus into different ducts, etc. We we don't know, um, and that's the issue. Um, we're picking up nucleic acid. So but I don't think that heaters. Again, I'm trying to rack my brains to see why that would be, but um, and there may be a very good logical reason, but I, I, I can't see it at the moment. Okay, Prof, I think we're coming towards the end. I'm going to ask maybe two more questions. And I think smoking has been in the data we've seen in other global data that smoking is one of the risk factors for severe disease uh, related to COVID. Um, I think there, there was just a question around that and your thoughts. And if so, why is smoking not banned? That is the question. And then the last question uh, from my side would be around uh, whether uh, CPR is considered an uh, aerosol generating procedure. Yes, I think CP CPR most definitely is an aerosol generating procedure. And um, if you're going to perform CPR on a COVID patient, you should definitely have appropriate uh, PPE on, including visor, including an N95 uh, gown or apron, etc. Um, in terms of smoking, yes, look, smoking and respiratory viruses and lung damage don't do well together, do they? Um, stopping banning smoking right this minute, is it going to do anything? Uh, smokers that do smoke, you know, already have damage. Um, and I think it's very difficult to make these blanket bans. Um, it's easier to do it with alcohol. Um, and that with alcohol, it's obviously more around how one tries to control gatherings, you know, I mean, in Shabins and other places. So, um, so, so alcohol, there may be a little bit more rationale to ban, make, a, uh, make it illegal to smoke, I think would be very, very challenging and probably not where our, um, where our considerable efforts that are going to be required in the next weeks and months to come uh, are, are warranted to be placed. Much as I'd like to ban smoking personally, but that's a person. A person. <laughs> yeah, it's many of us would. Thank you so much, Prof. I think just a reminder uh, that the webinar, I think we've seen quite a lot of uh, people asking if it is going to be available afterwards. So we're hoping by, in fact, by early next week, it will be available on the Discovery website on the HP Zone. So if you go there, you will see, you will also find some of the, of the previous uh, webinars and podcasts. Uh, we want to just give a special thanks to Prof for taking the time this evening to come and share such uh, valuable information. Uh, we would really appreciate if everyone can then uh, participate on the poll. It's going to be uh, uh, shown on the screen and you can just rate um, the experience today. Uh, it helps us a lot in terms of, you know, future planning of these, uh, of these webinars. And once again, thank you very much. Uh, if we didn't get to your question, we really apologize. 
but uh, we can still uh, you know address some of your questions if you email us directly um we can provide you with the with the with the answers that you require regarding cpd points as well because of the numbers that uh, you know participated in this poll which are quite significant it will take a few uh, days to to a week or so uh, to get the cpd points also uh, allocated so we really promised that you'll get your cpd points and that you will uh, have access to this webinar afterwards Thank you so much for joining us this evening and thank you so much once again Prof, for such valuable insights uh, and I think as this area of COVID continues to grow and we get more evidence, I mean these are going to be very useful platforms to share such information. Thank you once again and have a great evening all of us, all of you. Thank you.